Tech family, we're back. Today is the second part of my series where I explain everything you need to know to create high quality YouTube videos, what equipment to buy at any budget, and more importantly, how to use it. As I mentioned in the first video, since this is such a large topic, I've split this video into several easy to watch parts. The first part covered audio and lighting. The second part will cover cameras, lenses, and how to use them. The third part will cover how to present well on camera and what additional equipment you can buy to level up your video's quality even further. At the end, I'll sum up my favourite YouTube starter kits at a range of budgets from virtually nothing right through to full professional level setups. By the end of this series, hopefully you'll know everything that I learned in the past three years that I've been creating videos on YouTube. I'll post links to all the videos in this series in the description below, and to make shopping easy, I'll place affiliate links to all the gear I recommend down there too. Let's start with camera selection. Now, if you get your lighting right, as I covered in the first video, and you own a high-end smartphone, you could certainly try filming off it. The video quality will likely be viable. However, high-end smartphones tend to have their best cameras on the back, which means you won't be able to see yourself while filming, something critical for YouTube. If you can't see yourself while filming, you'll spend a ton of time going back and forwards to ensure you are correctly in the shot. To solve this, I'd suggest investing in an APS-C or Micro Four Thirds camera with a screen that flips around. APS-C and Micro Four Thirds refers to the sensor size. The size of the sensor affects many things that are too complex for me to explain in this video, but these two sensor sizes are great for YouTubers. You see, APS-C and Micro Four Thirds cameras and the lenses that are built for them are substantially cheaper than full frame cameras, plus they are much lighter. But their sensor is still good enough to produce a high quality image and create that shallow depth of field effect known as bokeh. This is an important effect, as it adds subject separation, forcing the viewer to focus on the subject and not be distracted by other things in the frame. Smaller cameras like those in your smartphone will struggle to do this well. They instead use artificial effects to mimic this. Not only do these not look as good, but they do not give you the control you need as a filmmaker. More on this later. The one I'd look to right now is the ZV-E10. I use the ZV-E10's bigger brother, the A6600, for my secondary B camera. There are a couple of reasons that I paid the extra dollars for it over the ZV-E10, such as the larger battery. Oh, and of course it wasn't released back then. I'll place links to other cameras I recommend in the description below. Your camera purchase doesn't just stop with the camera body. In fact, that's where it starts. In general, the kit lenses most cameras come with aren't the best optically, particularly for Sony cameras. I'd suggest you buy a better zoom lens. Prime lenses, ones that do not zoom, generally have better optics and are sometimes cheaper. However, they are far less efficient for creating videos. If you want to change the shot, you will likely have to move the entire camera and tripod, perhaps even change the lens. With a zoom, you can save time by reframing the shot. And yes, as I said, many prime lenses do have better optics than zooms, including wider apertures to allow you to shoot with an even shallower depth of field. But for YouTube videos, it's really not needed. For example, most of the advantage of better image quality will be lost due to compression. Most cameras convert higher resolution images down to 4K resolution, losing image definition. They then save them in a lossy format to save space. YouTube then applies additional compression and quality is further lost. Look, as I said with audio, you want to start with the best quality to get ahead of this, but I personally feel the extra quality of a prime lens over a zoom is just not worth the hassle. For Sony APS-C cameras, I'd get the new Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter zoom. By the way, on those numbers 18 to 50, these are the focal lengths. The lower the number, the wider the shot. The higher the number, the tighter the shot. Filming A-roll, i.e. you talking at the camera, you want a wider shot. But if you want to film products, you might want some nice tight shots. Having that flexibility is immensely helpful. By the way, the focal length is specific to the sensor size. An APS-C size sensor, like on the Sony camera I mentioned, is 1.5 times smaller than on a full frame camera. Therefore, you multiply the focal length of an APS-C lens by 1.5 to get its full frame equivalent, i.e. 16mm APS-C lens is equivalent to a 24mm full frame lens. This is the same with aperture, by the way, which I'll cover later in the video. The human eye tends to see things similar to a 50mm full frame lens, i.e. 33mm and APS-C lens. To keep things looking natural, I personally like to film at a similar focal length. 
As your channel grows, you can upgrade your camera and lenses. The most popular professional video camera for YouTube going around right now probably is the Sony a7S III, which is what I use for my main camera. It's a full frame camera with a larger sensor size that uses larger lenses. It's also a very expensive camera, especially when you include the cost of a nice lens for it. That being said, channels have grown to millions of subscribers with lesser cameras. So you've got the camera and lights, how the heck do you use it? The first thing you do is turn off auto mode and switch to manual. Not to be confused with manual focus by the way, more on focusing later. The reason you want to turn off auto mode is so you have complete control of the picture you are taking and can ensure it is additive to the story you are telling. For example, if you want to film a shot where certain things pop and others do not, your camera's auto mode is unlikely to read your mind. It might represent the scene differently to how you intended it to be. When in manual mode, there are three key settings to understand. They are referred to as the exposure triangle, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Shutter speed is the easiest for filmmakers to understand, as you generally just set it once and rarely change it. Most movies are filmed in 24 frames per second. The rule of thumb is you double the frames per second you are filming, and that is what your shutter speed should be. In this case, double 24 is a shutter speed of 1 over 48, or if your camera doesn't have that setting, go for 1 over 50. The higher the shutter speed, the faster the camera snaps an image. That means less light hits the sensor, so a darker image is produced, but less blur is caused from anything moving in the frame. 24 frames per second makes the amount of motion blur feel natural, similar to what your eyes see in real life. If you moved your hand very fast in front of your eyes, you'll notice blur. A shutter speed too high will make motion on camera feel artificial and may make your viewers subconsciously think something is wrong. I film at 30 frames per second with a 1 over 60 shutter speed, as I like things to be a little crisper but still have some natural blur. As a filmmaker, the only time you'll likely raise your shutter speed is to do a slow motion shot. For example, try filming in 60 frames per second, which is 1 over 120 shutter speed. Then in post-production, slow it down to half the speed, bam, you've created a glorious slow motion shot that matches the original 30 frames per second you were filming at. Aperture is the next setting I'd like to talk about. It refers to how large the opening from the lens is that allows light to hit the camera's sensor. The lower the f-stop number, the wider the aperture, and the more light hits the sensor. The aperture, combined with a focal length and where the subject you are focused on filming is, controls what in your scene is in focus and what is out. This is known as depth of field. For example, if you are filming a wide shot at 24mm using an aperture of f2.8, you will create a shallow depth of field making everything look blurry except what you are focusing on. If you increase the focal length as you tighten the shot to say 70mm, the depth of field becomes shallower and less will be in focus. If the wrong thing is in focus or focus keeps shifting, turn off autofocus and focus manually. It's really not that hard to do. If you want more of the shot in focus, say you are comparing two products together, you could easily raise the aperture's f-stop number or reduce the focal length. Keep in mind, every time you raise the aperture f-stop, the scene will get darker as you are reducing the amount of light hitting the sensor. The way you counter a dark scene can be through ISO, the third setting in the exposure triangle. ISO controls how sensitive your camera is to light. The higher the ISO, the lighter the scene is. The more you raise the ISO though, the lower the picture quality will be. The image ends up breaking apart if you raise it too high. That being said, don't be afraid to raise the ISO a bit to brighten a scene. The scene will generally look better with a higher ISO where everything is properly exposed, rather than using a lower ISO where parts of the scene are underexposed. I want to go back to the example I mentioned earlier about taking a slow motion shot. In that example, I suggested doubling the frames per second and upping the shutter speed from 1 over 60 to 1 over 120. Doing that will let far less light in. To compensate, you could raise the ISO so the scene is properly exposed. By the way, cameras do give exposure readings. You want the exposure to be as close to zero as possible. If it's too high, lower the lights or lower the ISO. If it's too low, try the reverse or even consider changing the aperture. Although, as mentioned, changing the aperture will change the depth of field and therefore the story you are telling through the image. But this is only part of the story of exposure. Any individual part of the scene that you are filming can be over or underexposed. Overexposed areas will often show up as too bright, so much so that you lose detail. Underexposed areas will appear too dark. The best way to deal with this is to try to even out the lighting in your scene. 
One way to do this is to add more lights, first turning up the brightness of a single light. Turning up the brightness of a single light may create an image where parts of the scene that the light hits are overexposed while other parts are underexposed. A computer screen, for example, may be too bright and can give your camera an incorrect exposure reading. To correctly read exposure, use a grey card held over spots of interest in your shot. You'll quickly see the difference in exposure. In my case, the laptop screen is too bright, and I need to turn it down to match the exposure in the rest of the scene. By the way, you don't necessarily need to have everything at the same exposure in your scene, of course not. I like to ensure the subject of the shot is a little brighter so you know what I'm talking about. That being said, this advice should hopefully help you be intentional in how you light a scene. All right, so that's the second part of my guide. If you like this video, you know what to do. Smash that like button, get subscribed, and click the notification bell. Not only does it show your appreciation for the insane amount of effort spent making these videos, but as I always say, it makes my mother very proud. Plus, it will ensure you're notified when I post the next part of the guide. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok for plenty of behind the scenes coverage and sneak peeks of hot new tech. Till next time, go do something awesome with your day, and I will catch you later.